Kirby. We all know him and we all love him. Or, at least I think. He's round, pink, and overall a very good boy. He has a big appetite and a bigger heart, always willing to help the little guys and stopping the threats from hurting his world and mainly his friends. What isn't there to love about the little pink puffball? Oh. Oh. Hello everyone, I'm TS Pro, and today I will attempt, keyword attempt, to explain the Kirby lore, also known as the most expanded upon and overcomplicated <laughs> since the FNAF novel days. This video is mainly being made up for a Discord server I'm in, but if you manage to find this video, please sit back, relax, and prepare to listen to me lose my <laughs> sanity over the Kirby lore. Alright, so to explain Kirby's lore, we're going to have to go by the game's chronological timeline order to not only keep myself, but everyone else in the loop of the convolution of what I'm about to put ourselves through. We will start off with what the fandom has dubbed as the Dark Matter Trilogy, which includes three titles from the series. These titles being Kirby's Dream Land 2, Kirby's Dream Land 3, and Kirby 64. But just before we hop into that, we need to discuss the first game in the Puffball Saga, this is what I would consider to be the prologue to the Dark Matter Trilogy. In the far reaches of the galaxy lives a planet called Popstar, a world that is in the shape of a star, no surprise, that is home to many biomes and cities that teem with life. This is also the homeworld of Kirby, King Dedede, and Meta Knight, and all the other mainline enemies you would encounter throughout the series. If you were kind of looking for Kirby's legitimate origins, then you're kind of out of luck. You could bring in the story from the animated series Kirby Right Back At Ya, but in terms of game continuity, this show isn't canon to the lore. So, as for in-game canon Kirby, we know literally nothing from where he came from, except for an idea that I'll talk about near the end of the video. Anywho! One night, while the residents of Dreamland had fallen asleep, King Deity and his minions invaded the land, stealing all the food from Dreamland because... yes. There's literally no reason as to why, so let's just move on. To Kirby, this was a big no-no in his eyes, so he rises up for the first time to get the stolen food back. And this is the plot of Kirby's first game, cut in short. You play as Kirby fighting through Dreamland until you reach Deity's castle, where you beat him in combat. After Deity's defeat, Kirby proceeds to blow himself up into a f***ing balloon, carrying the castle above Dreamland, where he proceeds to drop the food back onto the residents of Dreamland. Anyways, let's get back on the dark matter. In Kirby's Dreamland 2, we face off against the final boss of the game, this being known as the character Dark Matter. Black orb with a human eye in its center, that has smaller orbs on its side. Dark Matter can also take the form of a sword wielder, which isn't seen as much, but hey, it's there! In the game, Dark Matter's goal is to simply shroud the world in darkness, possessing King Deity to slip under the radar and plot out its plan. The reason for Dark Matter's attack is simply due to the fact that he was lonely and had no friends, causing it to lash out at the world. But this is Kirby, so he beats the ever-living out of it. Yay! In Kirby's Dream Land 3, we would get to see a bigger picture of the Dark Matter. This is where Zero enters the picture. Zero is the supposed leader of the Dark Matter species. Zero targeted Dream Land because it wanted to engulf the world in eternal darkness. Zero actually almost managed to engulf the world before Kirby stepped in at the last minute. But how? You see, the Dark Matter species are, from what I could gather, are souls from concentrated agony and sadness. Essentially, they're depression orbs that have the urge to kill. Now get this, their only weakness is friendship and positivity. It's like they're kryptonite in terms of Kirby lore. So with the help of Kirby's friends, they were able to create an item known as the Love Love Stick, which would slay Zero and his grasp over Dreamland for good. Well, not actually. In Kirby 64, we would face a similar threat that would emerge out of God knows where and attack another world known as Ripple Star. But unlike Planet Popstar, this planet is engulfed in the dark matter. 
Only one inhabitant will escape, however, and make their way towards Popstar, dragging Kirby along for another journey. Now, long story short, Kirby's journey leads him to the planet Shiverstar, which... Oh. Oh, I see. Basically, you fight a few goons, kill some dice-looking thing, and essentially rid Shivelstar from Dark Matter. We see the true enemy of the game after this, and WHAT THE ACTUAL f Okay, so Zero's back again, and survived the events of Dreamland 2, as indicated from the band-aid on his head. So, after a battle that surprisingly passed the E rating, Zero is destroyed again, putting a close to the Dark Matter trilogy, moving on. Okay, let's talk about the smaller sides of the Kirby lore. But, I want to talk about this little collection of smaller games from Kirby Superstar, before we talk about... It. I want to discuss the smaller parts of the Kirby continuity, like Revenge of Meta Knight. Long story short, Meta Knight causes a war in Dreamland, all because the inhabitants are too lazy for his liking. Yeah, that's pretty much it. There's also Gourmet Race, which has one of the best tracks in video game history. There's also an arena mode, as well as some minigame called Spring Breeze. I really don't know what it is. These minigames don't really apply much to the lore, so let's just talk about Saiyan himself already. In the side game called Milky Way Wishes, this is where we meet Marks, a small little jester that has a small bounty ball, and that he would soon trick Kirby into summoning a character called Galactic Nova. After forcing the fucking sun and moon to fight each other, what the hell?! Essentially a giant clockwork star that has no origin. He's just there because, well, he can. I like his design though. Looks like a cast face. Also, I should add that Nova has the ability to grant one wish to anyone or anything in encounters. So yeah. Uh, let's continue on. After Kirby summons Nova, Marks jumps in out of nowhere, ricochets Kirby, and takes the wish from him wishing to take full power over Popstar. The wish in turn transforms him into a bat-like demonic creature, which is just... J oh, j Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyways, Kirby beats him up along with the other help of the Sun and Moon. Nova explodes and Marks is dead. Or is he? See, a few years down the line, we would get a remastered version of Kirby Superstar, and with it comes a follow-up for Marks. Essentially what happens is Marx is somehow still alive after the events of the original game, and he somehow manages to absorb Nova's energy, coming back yet again, to fight Kirby one last time. Kirby kicks his ass though, and although it seems like he's actually dead, he's not. When we see Marx again, he appears in the latest game in the timeline called Kirby Superstar Allies, and the little demon spawn actually has a change of heart from this point in the timeline. From the game's description, it reads, The comic jester from Kirby Superstar senses danger from afar and is ready to roll across the galaxies on his ball. The final boss is here to help, with it even stating in quotations from his own words, Got a plan? Glad to help. This is basically where Marx's story ends. He started off as a great threat, but inevitably would have a change of heart becoming a close ally to the Pink Puffball. But now let's move on to the next game in the timeline. Kirby and the Amazing Mirror Kirby and the Amazing Mirror is a very important point from the lore standpoint, as this is the game that would introduce the Mirror Dimension, a place that would lay host to warped versions of the characters. The Mirror will be brought back later, so please pay attention. There is a land called the Mirror World that exists high in the skies of Dreamland. It is a world where the any wish can be reflected into the mirror, and it will come true. One day, however, it only copies negative thoughts and rapidly changes the world into a cesspool of evil as a result. Meta Knight notices this, and recognizes this as a threat to not only the mirror world itself, but also to the native dreamland. As Meta Knight gets close, he is attacked by his warped reflection, Dark Meta Knight. Yeah, that's as creative as they got with the name. The two Meta Knights fight each other, but the real Meta Knight is defeated and is knocked into the mirror dimension. Ah! 
which is then cut into eight fragments by Dark Meta Knight. Those fragments are then scattered across the mirror world. Meanwhile, Kirby is taking a walk when Dark Meta Knight appears. Before Kirby can react, Dark Meta Knight slices Kirby into four differently colored Kirbys. <sighs> the four Kirbys chase after Dark Meta Knight and enter the mirror world. Along the way, we encounter the mirrored version of Kirby, which is named Shadow Kirby. They collect and reunite the mirror shards so that they can gain access to the area where Meta Knight is being held and defeat Dark Meta Knight. But near the end of the game, they face off against the final boss, Dark Mind, who wants to conquer both the Mirror Dimension and Dreamland. The Kirbys defeat Dark Mind and break Meta Knight free. All the Kirbys go their own ways, and Dreamland is saved yet again. Got all that? Good. Let's move on to Kirby Squeak Squad. Now, Kirby Squeak Squad is small in terms of lore. The game is simple. Kirby's cake is stolen by a mysterious figure, which leads Kirby on another killing spree because he's hungry. So let's just cut to the chase. At the end of the game's first world, Kirby finds out that the Squeaks, an infamous group of treasure-thieving mice, are the ones that took the cake. Kirby follows the thieves on a journey that takes him all over Dreamland. Kirby eventually fights the leader of the Squeaks, named The Roach, at the end of the sixth level, Ice Island. After winning the battle, he comes close to obtaining a treasure chest which supposedly contains his cake, when Meta Knight suddenly swoops in and snatches the chest away. Kirby chases Meta Knight to the end of the seventh world, Secret Sea, where a duel between the two frenemies ensue. Meta Knight is defeated and gives up the chest, which Kirby is about to open, when suddenly the squeaks fly by and grab it from him. What the f- Daroach opens it, but the chest does not contain Kirby's cake. Instead, a dark cloud envelops the roach and flies into outer space. What? Kirby follows, eventually encountering and fighting the roach again. Now amply named Dark the Roach. Who is naming these things? Once beaten, the dark cloud lets go of the squeak's leader and floats away into the form of a small black colored star. Kirby follows the star to a crystalline area where the Black Star transforms into its true form, called Dark Nebula, ruler of the Underworld, and a specimen of Kirby's old enemy, Dark Matter. <coughs> Kirby confronts the Fiend, and after a short and intense battle, triumphs over the monster, who disintegrates and f***ing explodes. Afterwards, Kirby, wondering where his cake really is, travels back to his home as the credits roll. Meanwhile, a bubble containing his treasured dessert follows close behind, once the credits finish. The Squeaks have returned the cake, supposedly as an apology for all the trouble they had caused. The Roach would return later in Kirby Star Allies as another ally to Kirby, making another villain turn to the good side. Now, the next few games that are indeed canon don't really serve much of a purpose in terms of lore. They're kind of just there as filler fun games. These games are Kirby Mass Attack and Kirby Canvas Curse. There's nothing much besides Kirby rolling around in Canvas Curse and the Horde of Chaos that is Kirby Mass Attack. Now, it's time to move on to the game where lore really, and I mean really, picks up. The previous two parts were over small basic things. So from this point on, we're getting into some real sh The next game in the timeline, which was also my first introduction to the puffball, is Kirby's Return to Dreamland. On another peaceful day in Dreamland, Kirby is running with Cake while being chased by King Dee Dee and Bandana Waddle Dee. The three of them run past Meta Knight, who is sitting on top of a small hill reading a book, as he slightly glances over at them. Just then, a bright light shines in the sky and catches the attention of all of them. Suddenly a rift opens and a ship emerges and it begins to plummet from the sky. Our heroes run over to examine the crash site afterwards. That escalated quickly. The four of them eventually reach the crash site and find the ship's hull mostly intact. Immediately after they arrive, the ship's doors open up and Kirby then peers inside. The four wander into the ship looking around at its interior. 
And this is where we would find the character named Magalor, lying unconsciously on the ground. Magalor wakes up, looking like a canatonic crackhead, and looks to the screen, seeing that the parts from his ship have been lost and scattered across Dreamland. Kirby seeing the distraught on Magalor's face lets him know that he'll help out and get the ship's parts back. As Dee Dee, Banana Waddle and Meta Knight agree to help as well. And so, their next journey begins. Now, as you progress through the game collecting parts, we can learn more about Magalor, and this is where we learn a good chunk of lore. As we talk to Magalor, we learn that he is native to a planet called Halkandra, and mentions a race known as the Ancients, which we would see more of in Kirby Star Allies. The Ancients are a species of unknown appearance that have a massive influence over a great deal of the events found in the background of the Kirby series. They were known to be extremely powerful to the point where they were able to alter the fabric of reality to their will. I... They are also responsible for creations of legendary artifacts that would grant their users the ability to reshape certain aspects of their reality, which are actually what cause a majority of the threats in the Kirby series. For instance, it turns out that Nova Stars, yeah, that thing where I accidentally said had no origin, were created by the Ancients. Yeah, apparently that's a thing. And since the Ancients themselves have seemingly left the Kirby multiverse for an unknown reason, they left behind their legendary tools that can essentially transform whoever knows how they use them into being similar to gods. Speaking of which, there's actually a snippet of dialogue that suggests that Magalore and Marks actually know each other. As through the dialogue, Magalore explains that he encountered one of Kirby's enemies drifting through space that had been defeated by the Puffball himself. Although this is only a theory, it's widely speculated that this enemy was Marks. So throughout the game, you collect parts to the ship, which is called the Lore Star Cutter, and eventually the ship is fully repaired. And for his thanks, Magalore takes the crew to his homeworld of Halkandra. As the Lore Star Cutters enter Halkandra's atmosphere, Landia, which is a four-headed f***ing dragon, notices the ship and proceeds to blast it out of the sky, causing it to crash once again. Magalor wakes up and checks on the control panel to see what had attacked. The screen shows that Landia was the one who had caused the damage, and showcases his immense power scale and danger level. Magalor once again looks down in despair. However, Kirby and friends reassure him once more, offering to defeat Landia for him. Magalor proceeds to thank them again, and the heroes then set off on their quest to defeat Landia. So Kirby and his friends fight their way through Halkandra where they would face off against Landia, which guards a powerful artifact that was created by the Ancients known as the Master Crown. The Master Crown itself is so powerful that whoever wields it has the power to literally crush universes, I'm not joking. So after we defeat Landia, the crown falls off its head, and the day is saved, right?
So yeah, basically Magalore reveals that he's just a power hungry it turns out that Landia was the one who was actually the good guy in this situation, protecting the crown so no harm could be done to the universe. Then Landia waddles up the Kirby, grabbing him, and throws him up onto his back. The other heroes follow suit and ride the backs of the other Landias to take down the Kirby and his friends fly through another dimension, dodging and maneuvering around objects and threats until they encounter Magalore. Thoroughly pissed, Magalore sends the Lore Starcutter out to attack Kirby and the others, and you have to battle against the very ship you repaired throughout the whole game until it's destroyed. Magalore, now extremely pissed off, uses his voodoo nonsense and shoots down the heroes one by one, leading them to their final face-off. Kirby and his allies fight against Magalore, and may I say, it's one hell of a fight. But it wouldn't be long until Kirby uses one of his super abilities and slices down on Magalore, cutting him down for good in the most badass way possible. Oh. Okay. What we're looking at here is Magalore's soul. A soul that has a very familiar looking entity from within its mouth. The Master Crown itself, from what I believe, holds the soul of a Dark Matter entity, possibly another form of Zero, that has completely morphed Magalore into a dark variant of what he once was, trapping him within his own mind. This is where the final fight begins, as Kirby and his friends strike back against the universe-destroying monster. This absolute masterpiece plays in the background, really making the player feel like they're fighting against a true threat. Have a listen for yourself. But the soul is no match for the four heroes, as Magalore is broken free from the crown's grasp, and they all return to Dreamland with another day saved. After the events of Dreamland, let's just say that Magalore felt really, and I mean really bad. So bad, in fact, that he straight up makes up to everyone by building a whole goddamn amusement park on Dreamland. So yeah, no hard feelings, right? After this game, Magalore would remain a present force in the Kirby games, sometimes selling apples and even being one of the good guys in Star Allies. But with Dreamland done, let's move on to the next game in the timeline, Kirby Triple Deluxe. After a day of fishing, flying, and relaxing, Kirby goes to bed, and then awakens to find that a massive beanstalk called a Dreamstalk has lifted his house high above the ground while he was sleeping. J Jesus Christ, okay. Upon noticing this, he runs out of his house in shock, then falls from his home onto a part of the Dreamstalk before seeing that Castle Deity was also lifted. Kirby proceeds to climb the Dreamstalk to reach the castle, and spots a spider-like creature. This character's name is Taranza. 
and he's entering the castle. Kirby curiously follows Taranza and watches as he dispatches many of King Dedede's Waddleys before he proceeds to capture Dedede himself, surrounding him in a strange purple aura. Taranza breaks through the castle's glass ceiling and ascends the Dreamstalk with the self-proclaimed king in tow. Kirby follows close behind and enters Flor... Flor... Alia? Florida. We're gonna call it Florida. A series of floating islands to rescue Dedede. In one way or another, Taranza prompts all Kirby's boss battles. No, really. When Kirby catches up to him at the end of the land, Taranza either aggravates an enemy or animates that with his spider web esque magic, so as to stall the pursuer and buy himself time to get ahead. But let's reach the near end of the game where the story really picks up. Near the end, Kirby confronts Taranza, who assumes Kirby followed him in order to save the quote unquote hero of the lower world referring to King Dedede. Taranza then says he'll return their precious hero to them, adding an ominous quip, but he may be a little more hostile than you remember. Taranza then takes complete control of King Dedede, turning him into masked f***ing Dedede, and forces him to fight Kirby using puppet strings. I swear, Dedede can't catch a break with possession these days. Poor guy. After Kirby defeats Mass Deity, Taranza enhances Mass Deity's powers further, causing his robes to turn purple. The juiced up Mass Deity grabs an axe from a nearby statue and confronts Kirby once more. In spite of this, Deity is defeated again and what remains of his mask is destroyed. Taranja's control over the king dissipates, and he returns to normal. Taranja approaches, un un approaches the unconscious deity, confused as to how Kirby defeated him, for he has done just as his master ordered. He then realizes that Kirby must be the true hero from the land below. So, to save himself, Taranja then summons his master, Queen Sectonia, to save him. Ew. Christ, it, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> now, who is Queen Sectonia? Because she just wasn't really brought up until this point on. I will say, her origins is a bit of a tragic one. Long before the events of Kirby Triple Deluxe, Sectonia was once a kind and fair queen, ruling over her own clan of insectoid like beings who lived peacefully in Florida. Taranza, her best friend and lover, stole the dimension mirror from the mirror world. Yeah, you heard me right, that mirror from earlier, and gave it to Sectonia as a tribute of love. Sectonia loved the mirror and gazed into it day after day. Unfortunately, when she looked into the mirror each time, the mirror's dark power slowly twisted her mind, beginning her the plummet in the madness turning her present self into the twisted version from that mirror dimension. Her obsession with her own beauty was magnified to a dangerous degree, losing herself in her own vanity and delusions. She grew tyrannical and power-hungry. Using her magic, she possessed many other beings, alienating her servants with her changing appearances, before eventually taking over and settling on the body of her current bee-like form for its beauty. Then, she took over all of Florida, and ruled it with an iron fist, in which her people suffered, leading to the events of the current story. Sectonia is displeased by Taranza's failure to follow her orders, and she immediately blasts him out of the castle and into the sky before turning to attack Kirby. And I just want to say, similar to Magalore, this fight theme is a bop.
After Kirby beats Sectonia, he begins to celebrate with a reawakened King Deity. However, Queen Sectonia rises again and combines herself with the god f***ing Dreamstalk. Alright then. Under her control, the Dreamstalk's vines begin to grow explosively, covering all up of Florida and Dreamland, and even Planet Popstar itself. After this, some discount troll toys appear that you saved earlier in the game. They give you a cannon-like device that Kirby and King Deity use to come back the vines. King Deity rapidly shoots Kirby at the flowers onto the vines to open up a path to Queen Sectonia, which he then fires the pink puffball through to reach her. Kirby then ascends the final stretches of the Dreamstalk, battling Queen Sectonia in a second time. Just as Kirby begins to celebrate, a vine grabs him by the foot, and Sectonia rises for a third goddamn time. Oh my god. Just then, King Deity, carried by Taranza, arrives, ready to help. Taranza tosses King Deity at Kirby, and the king smacks his little buddy free from Sectonia's grasp with his hammer. King Deity throws the KO'd Kirby at Taranza, who gives him an item called the Miracle Fruit, granting his Hypernova ability, filling him with life. I also like to call this ability, The Big Suck. Kirby confronts Sectonia one more time, who uses the buds on her vines to fire missiles at Kirby and shield herself. Kirby inhales the buds and shoots them back at her until the shield is destroyed, breaking Sectonia's ability to create a shield. A withered Sectonia then makes one last attempt to defeat Kirby by firing an enormous beam at him, only for Kirby to inhale the beam with the big suck and send it back at her, finally defeating her for the third time and setting the queen free. It is explained that the Dreamstalk was to bring a hero to save them from Sectonia's cruel reign. Although the Dreamstalk did not directly bring Kirby to Florida's rescue, he still ended up saving Florida regardless. With the ordeal with Sectonia over, Kirby, Deity, and Taranza, and the people of the sky, which is the troll-looking things, Notice that the Dreamstalk, now purged from her influence, had fully bloomed, serving as a new landmark in Dreamland. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, that, that was a lot. Tyranza would later appear again in Kirby Star Allies. This is becoming a trend, I know. So with that, let's talk about Kirby piloting a f mech. On yet another peaceful day in Dreamland, everything was safe and sound. And this is already starting to sound familiar. Because the next thing we know, a giant alien hovercraft drills itself into Popstar, asserting its dominance. What the actual f is happening anymore. This ship is called the Axis Ark and it is the home of the Haltman Works Company. Many inhabitants such as King Deity and Mennonite watch on in shock as the base covers the sky. Kirby, however, is sleeping under a tree. The company then begins to invade the planet, drilling the Ark's five legs into the five corners of the planet and turning its surface into a mechanized world. Oh my f <laughs> King Deity and Meta Knight attempt to retaliate against the invaders, but get completely screwed over in the process. Kirby, after sleeping through the entire event, wakes up from his nap to, com to a completely mechanized world and sets out to restore his homeland to normal. I swear to god, this little guy has balls of steel at this point. Nothing stops him. Shortly into his adventure, Kirby is attacked by one of the Haltman Works Company soldiers piloting a large mech suit called the Invader Armor. After Kirby defeats it, the grunt is knocked from the pilot's seat, allowing Kirby to hijack the mech for himself by transforming it into his own personal Praetor suit. Oh my god! <laughs> It wouldn't be long until Kirby meets Susie, the secretary and executive assistant of the Haltman Works Company. She informs him that the company is harvesting the vast resources from Popstar, and its natives are obstacles to be removed. She attempts to kill Kirby, but her business suit proves unable to defeat Kirby, forcing her to flee. When Kirby encounters Susie again, she reveals Meta Knight was captured and turned into a cyborg called Mecha... Mecha Knight. She deploys the newly minted Mecha Knight before retreating again, leaving Kirby to battle his mechanized rival. The Pink Warrior triumphs, but Mecha Knight collapses into a deep ravine before he can be freed from the Haltman Works Company's control. Christ. After fighting through waves of defenses and powerful robots, Kirby reaches the very heart of the arc, the office of the President himself. There Kirby meets Susie yet again. After remarking that he needs to be taught manners, she brings out a newly upgraded version of Mecha Knight called Mecha Knight Plus. Very creative, guys. And leaves him to fight Kirby. Still, Kirby manages to defeat him. With Meta Knight freed from his mind control, Susie prepares to take the situation to her own hands. However, President Haltman chooses that moment to reveal himself. He expresses his disappointment in Susie's performance and dismisses her from the office before, con <laughs> before confronting Kirby. Now, I think it's time to actually explain who Susie is, and like Sectonia, her tale is kind of sad. Before the events of Kirby Planet Robobot, Susie was with her father, President Holtman. Yeah, that's right, these two are related. Holman had recently begun performing tests on a machine he reactivated known as Stardream. During one of these tests, presumably one for Stardream's space-time transport program, a terrible accident occurred in which Susie was warped into another dimension. Okay. During her time spent there, she gathered data, learning about life in the other world. Susie eventually somehow returned from another dimension after growing up aiming to be hired by the Haltman Works Company. She easily passed their difficult exam, all the while having no known resume. However, President Haltman no longer recognized her as his daughter due to losing his memories from the excessive use from an incomplete star dream in an attempt to bring her back in life after he thought that she had died in the incident. Nonetheless, he felt that she was somewhat familiar 
and thus hired her as the secretary and executive assistant for his company, making her the only organic life form apart from Haltman himself to hold position of power in the company. Now back to current events, good god. Holtman reveals that the company has been studying the most advanced civilizations in the universe, allowing them to reactivate Stardream, the most powerful supercomputer in existence. After showing the machine the Kirby, he engages him in battle, using a powerful mech suit of his own. Nonetheless, the champion of Planet Popstar emerges triumphant again. Enraged by the savages of the world, Holman activates Stardream by using a special helmet to take control of it. However, before Holtman could use it, Susie suddenly snatches the helmet from Holtman's head, causing something to go wrong and Holtman to pass out. Susie then reveals her plans to sell Stardream's database to start up a company for a huge sum of money. When Susie tries to don the control helmet, however, Stardream turns sentient and blasts her unconscious with a laser. It then takes control of Holtman's body and speaks through him. It f***ing speaks through him. It explains that he has been studying the cosmos through the Holtman Works Company, and that it has found all life forms to be a liability to the company's goal of eternal prosperity, announcing its intent to wipe out all life in existence. And Stardream launches itself into space! Jesus Christ! When Susie realized what happened, she summons an invader armor and decides that Kirby would be the best suited to use it concerning how far he's come. She then pleads for Kirby to stop Stardream. Kirby immediately leaps aboard, transforming the armor into his robobot armor. As Meta Knight arrives aboard the Halberd from atop it, Meta Knight beckons to Kirby, who promptly uses the armor to, kid you not, fuse with the f Halberd, in which it makes a giant mechanized warship, and they pursue Stardream in it. God, this series is wild. In space, the Hullbird encounters Stardream, which then engages its battle mode to stop the ship. After failing to do so, Stardream takes control of the entire Axis arc, becoming a sentient planet! The Halberd breaks off the Axis point shell piece by piece, revealing it to be none other than a goddamn Nova Star. Okay, that's a pretty cool twist, I'm not gonna lie. Throughout the fight, Stardream is progressively absorbing Haltman, and after another failure at defeating its foes, Stardream shoots down the Halberd with a laser. Forcing Meta Knight to shoot out the Robobot armor and Kirby, who then charge at Stardream with the armor's hand turned into a giant screwdriver. After the explosion, Kirby is knocked unconscious. The robot armor then proceeds to reach in and remove Kirby and send him back to Popstar. But 
But as the robot armor floats in the space, it sheds a tear at the loss of Kirby, showing that even machines have feelings. How sad. Kirby wakes up on solid ground, being placed safely by Meta Knight. King Didi and Waddle Dee emerge from the rubble of the castle and rejoice at the restoration of peace. And Susie just flies off in her mech suit until she would return to aid Kirby again in Star Allies. Kirby watches as Meta Knight flies on the halberd looking proudly into the distance. Kirby waves to Meta Knight and proceeds to run after the halberd. <laughs> Okay, we've reached everything up to the most latest game in the series, a game that I have been mentioning throughout this entire video, that game being Kirby Star Allies, which if you haven't guessed by now is practically Kirby's endgame, as this game is essentially the climax and celebration of the series. I mean, just look at this art, literally everyone from the series is here for one big finale. So let's not waste time. Talk about this jam-packed game, because there is a lot. In a part of space away from Planet Popstar, a priest named Highness, who is in fact an ancient, floats up to the altar of the Jamba Heart, which is trapped in a seal. Using his magic, he commences a ritual to break the seal and revive his religious god. However, since he did not fully understand how to break the seal, the ritual went wrong, causing the Jamba Heart to shatter and send its shards flying throughout the galaxy. Many of these pieces fall down the dreamland, where many residents watch in awe as the shards fall from the sky. The shards then corrupt and possess anyone to, that they have fallen near to. Kirby, however, is taking an afternoon nap and slept through the entire event, like always. During Kirby's nap, a pink shard which was not dispersed by the Jamba Heart, but rather the heart spears containing it in its seal, lands and dissolves on him. Odd, right? Kirby then wakes up, seeing Waddle Dee's rushing towards Dee's castle carrying food, very similar to how his journey had begun all those years ago. Apparently King Dee Dee has stolen all the food in Dreamland for himself once again forcing Kirby to go on a quest to stop him. At the beginning of his adventure, Kirby is ambushed by a Poppy Bros Jr. and panics. However, he soon discovers that the pink heart gave him the ability to create a friend heart, which can turn anyone into a friend. He then uses his newly found power to befriend the Poppy Bro and other enemies and continue on his journey with his new friends. They make their way to the castle where they encounter a corrupted king deity eating all the stolen food and Jesus Christ! <laughs> After defeating King Dedede, Kirby and his friends celebrate, but the celebration is cut short when the Jamba Heart piece hovers back into the air and flies away. Kirby and friends pursue the fleeing Jamba Heart piece, chasing it while joining up with old foes turned allies for extra help, before eventually encountering a corrupted Meta Knight. Kirby and friends manage to defeat and free Meta Knight, but then the ground begins to shake as a giant fortress then lands on the surface of the planet. Kirby and friends then hop on the Warp Star and fly towards the fortress to stop these mysterious invaders. 
approaching the fortress, which is called Jambashton, the Fortress of Shadows, Kirby and his friends soon encountered the three Mage Sisters, the magic generals who command Jambashton and serve under Highness. They first meet Francisca, who snatches a Jamba Heart shard before the heroes could grab it. She then introduces herself before explaining their task, which is to collect the shards in order to successfully complete the ritual, so that their visions will come to fruition. She warns the Quarit not to interfere, before attacking them. However, she is defeated. Francisca then promptly flees with the Jamba Heart Shard, as Kirby and friends chase after her. The heroes next meet Flameberg, who did not- oh my god, I, I don't even know how the f*** you say that- who had noticed them and preemptively jumped over to them, absolutely furious that they hurt Francisca. She attacks them to exact vengeance. Nonetheless, she is also defeated and flees with the shards as well. Kirby and his friends at the last way find their way to the top, where they meet the final member of the three mage sisters and leader of the three, Zan... I'm just going to call her Zan. After introducing herself and commenting that they had turned out to be more of an annoyance than she had expected, she attacks to end the threats they pose, but is defeated like the other two. In a last-ditch effort to eliminate them, she quickly grabs the Jamba heart piece she was holding and destroys the Jambashton power core, causing the fortress to crumble. Kirby and Co. escape, however. <laughs> Making their way through space, they enter the altar of the Jamba Heart, where Highness is performing a ritual that is reassembling the Jamba Heart. Before they could approach him, however, Zan appears and blocks their path to prevent interruption of the ceremony. She fights fiercely, but is beaten again. She then weakly calls the Highness, begging him for help, before losing consciousness. Displeased with the interruption, Highness bats her aside and confronts the heroes. He states that the Jamba Heart still does not have enough energy for the ritual, and upset by that fact, goes into a frenzied rant. Here, Highness explains his history. Although it's heavily altered in the English localization for unknown reasons, in the original Japanese version, Highness does not use the ambiguous we, as he instead refers to his clan as his own. And this is what he states. Pay attention. It's really important. He states that his clan, who were powerful wielders of magic and worshippers of the matter of darkness, was once friends with the people who used the power of science. Together they achieved great prosperity. However, one day, the science users turned on them in fear of their power and banished them to the edge of the galaxy. They then subsequently erased their very existence from history itself, not leaving a sliver left besides their creations. The Ancients. Highness also states that his clan was responsible for stopping a galactic crisis, but as of right now, it's unknown what this crisis was. Enraged by this being how his clan was repaid, Highness exclaims that the science user's future is non-existent, that the restoration of his clan is near, and that his religion has finally obtained the vessel which its god would descend from and give his benevolence as told in the Book of Lenjin. It could be presumed that his clan wrote this book, akin to the Holy f Bible and other religious books. I'm not kidding. He then says that the Dark Lord's revival is almost complete, and to prevent more interruptions in the revival ceremony, Highness attacks. Upon first defeat, Highness' hood and veil are knocked off, sending him into insanity. He summons the three mage sisters to himself, promptly draining their life force to restore his own, and uses their unconscious bodies as weapons in the continued battle.
Despite his attempts, Highness is defeated again and is sent flying onto the ground. Getting up, he slowly limps over to the altar, realizing that an offering to the Dark Lord is the only option. And in a last ditch effort, he sacrifices himself and the three unconscious mage sisters into the Jamba Heart, reviving their god. And out from the void emerges what is essentially the god of the Kirby universe, Void Termina. The final battle begins. The fight with Void Termina is a 360 type of fight as Kirby and his allies fight on a warp star, destroying dark matter like eyes that lay across its armor. The tattoos on Void Termina's body shows markings of what came before, showing that everything could have been some sort of prophecy up to this point. As you fight the destroyer of worlds, he will use attacks from earlier games such as swords and shockwaves, and when Void Termina enters its flying form, it has the ability to summon master crowns from thin air. As I stated earlier with Magalore, just one of these items could wipe out a whole ass universe. So with Void Termina being able to summon multiple at will just shows how deadly this being is. But the true fight isn't until you actually knock off the mask of Void Termina and are sucked into the body where we see the true form of Void Termina from the description it reads, no one knows whence he came from, only that he existed for eons, unchanging and unrelenting, perpetually roaming the cosmos, he has finally arrived, and now he has begun to feel, to desire, to think. Within the void lurks a soul, and as that soul takes notice of Kirby, it transforms until it takes the form of something familiar, but something unexpected. This brings up more questions than answers really, as the soul of Void Termina looks almost identical to our hero. From the Void's description, it reads, Void exists in all dimensions, but his shining form in another dimension inspired the ancients to transcribe his mysteries in the sacred text. What will be written next? Will the new scrolls describe a destroyer of worlds, or perhaps an ally to the stars? As we battle against the soul, it proceeds to laugh and use attacks from previous games from other final bosses. The soul is like a child playing rough of Kirby, like he's its favorite toy. All the while, a darker version of Green Greens blares in the background. But as we fight more and more, we see the other form of Void, and its shape is something that you should all recognize by now. Yeehaw! 
dark matter. I forgot to bring him up earlier, but the character Gooey is in fact a member of the dark matter species that managed to break away and become its own peaceful entity. But up until this point, there had been no little, if no, connections to dark matter, the Kirby. If you battle Void on the hardest difficulty, you will fight a more corrupt version of Void. If it's stating in the pause screen, no telling if it's true, but according to the ancient scrolls, Void Termina may rise again in other forms depending on whether positive or negative energy is gathered. It seems that this being of darkness will wander the galaxy until one day, he is reborn in a new existence. When he returns, hopefully it will be as... a friend. But this is merely the center of the real story. When you encounter Star Ally's hardest mode, when you fight Void, it emerges as the Astral Birth. Introduced with a splash screen identical to Zero's from Dreamland 3 in that final battle, this Void fight is the hardest challenge in the whole game, probably the hardest challenge in any Kirby game. It fights Kirby with the most aggressive attacks as humanly possible. In the soundtrack of the fight is a saddened harmonic version of Green Greens, making this difficult fight feel like a climax of two powerful entities, and near the reset of the track is the original Green Greens theme from the Game Boy, slowed down. This track is symbolically beautiful. If you somehow managed to not get it yet, then here's the truth, plain and simple. Void is a dark matter. Dark matter is Kirby. The Void is a Kirby. A Kirby born of agony and hatred and sadness instead of friendship and joy. Kirby himself at one point was some sort of dark matter soul that broke away from his destructive appetite like nature to make friends and live a happy life in peace. Kirby, Kirby, is literally a god. Void is the opposite of Kirby, and Kirby is the opposite of Void. It's yin and yang, and only the power of Kirby's love and friendship can set the Void free. The final battle is at hand. Void takes his first steps towards a new age. In place of tyrannical rage, will he find nap time, gentle breezes, treats? He may even dream again. A dream of friends reunited.
Wow, that was a lot. But that is currently the end of where Kirby's lore is at. Now you may be asking, what about Nightmare, Galactonite, and some other bullshit? Well, just to keep them short and simple here, as from what I know, they aren't in the main timeline. Well, Galactonite isn't. Rather, they are in some sort of what-if scenario to the franchise. So I'll just keep it short and simple before we end this off. Nightmare, despite only making three major appearances in the games, he only has one goal, and that goal being to spread dark nightmares and influences throughout the galaxy, and uses his cunning wit to accomplish the feat. And that's basically it. He's pretty irrelevant. And Galactonite is a character that debuts as the final boss of Meta Nightmare, an ultra sub-game of Kirby Superstar Ultra. He is the greatest and most powerful warrior in the galaxy from the ancient past, but all of his games are in side stories, uncanon scenarios to the main plot. And don't even get me started on this sh But that sums up the whole Kirby lore as of right now. As Kirby's next adventure is about to debut in March, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, which honestly looks like so much fun. And in terms of story, this seems to be the first chapter in whatever next phase is going for Kirby, and I cannot wait to play it and see what the story has in store. Anyways, I hope you all aren't as exhausted as I am. This is like my third day working on this sh Like I, I, I've literally done nothing but work on this for three days straight. I'm, I'm really tired. And, uh, well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe because my content is honestly all over the place at the moment. If you want to see more videos like this, leave the, well, leave a comment down below. And if you want me to cover the uncanon parts of Kirby lore, leave that down there as well. Because my, as exhausting as this was, I actually had a lot of fun making it. So yeah, I will see you all in, I don't know, maybe a creepypasta, Fortnite. Like I said, my account, my account is all over the place. See you then. Have a good day.